I'm very pleased that Patrick put a coffee break into this morning, which he didn't do yesterday, and it was tough for some of us. And I'd like you all to know, 1% of people over the age of 60 get Parkinson's disease, but you can half your risk if you drink three cups of coffee a day. And it's not the caffeine, it's other alkaloids in the coffee. So Red Bull will not do. So you may not be a coffee drinker. My wife, a dietitian, sitting right there in the middle, won't touch coffee. But I, I have my three cups a day, despite Patrick's attempts to prevent that yesterday. Now, yesterday morning on this podium, Dame Ellen spoke, and in the most dramatic way, she pointed out, with those pictures of her trimaran in the Southern Ocean, about finite resources. She said, what you have when you're on that boat is what you have. And it set me thinking, you know, what you have is what you have. And very quickly on my phone during that meeting, <clears throat> I'm assuming I'll live to be 90. So I have 200,000 hours left to live. That's it. What I have is 200,000 hours. So why waste any of those 2,000 hours in any way at all? And the way to optimize them is through health. And the way to optimize health is through what we eat and the exercise we take. It is not through taking aspirin, statins, blood pressure drugs. It's the regime. The problem is, you know, I was a, a doctor for 44 years. I started the year Patrick got to his farm as a graduate. I was a GP for 37 of the 44 years. And the tragedy of that is that the amount of attention paid by doctors to food and the amount of teaching that medical students get about food, nutrition, eating, the molecules we put into ourselves is no better now than it was in the late 60s when I was a student. And that's, I think, that's a disaster. And if we can achieve anything today, it will be to somehow promote to the people in charge of teaching and the doctors in active practice that they must pay attention to those factors more than they currently do. There's just a nod to, oh, look after your diet, you know, eat well. And that's about as good as it gets. They pay no more attention to sleep either, I might say. So I, th I think we've got to somehow get a big change in the way doctors are educated, despite the fact that there's a huge agenda of what they have to learn. Um, now, there was one other thing I was going to just tell you that on the run-up to this, there was a, a study published in Japan by a very good cohort of scientists in Tokyo in which they've managed to show that if you eat one item of citrus fruit a day, you reduce your chances of dementia by 25%. But the man out there reading this, and it was in the Times newspaper, the man out there reading this will think, oh, I must give grandpa an orange every day. You've got to eat that orange a day for a long while. You can't treat your dementia by eating an orange. In other words, food and what we eat is much more about prevention than what they've got in the rag today, which are a series of interviews of people with multiple sclerosis or asthma who changed their diet and made their condition better. And I haven't read the article yet, although I wrote the comment, but what I suspect those people are doing is attributing their improvements when they have conditions that anyway exacerbate and remit, and they're attributing the fact they got better to the fact they started taking omega-3 capsules or whatever it might be, when actually they were scheduled to get better anyway through that phase. So it's about a very long-term strategy with food. And the great thing is we have three marvelous speakers. Um, Graham Harvey, of course, an expert agriculturalist. And I'm sure he won't mind my saying that he conveys a lot of the ideas that go into the archers every day, and he's going to talk a little bit about what's happened in farming as the setting for two scientists. So we have Angelica, um, who you will see from her biography is a nutritionist and an expert on food, and Aruni from the United States, trained really as a cardiologist, but now very closely allied with the environmental impact of the various adversities that damage our hearts and the rest of our body, and he's going to be very interesting. 
So I'll step down now and keep a bit quieter and welcome Graham up here. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm going to set the scene by talking a bit about what's happened to agriculture in Britain in my lifetime. And uh, I think it, it's not reflected in the arches, unfortunately, but it, I think it's been a catastrophe. And uh, I grew up in a world of uh, mixed farms. Um, we've known about sustainable agriculture and productivity sustainably for many years. In fact, this is the English mixed farm. In, uh, that's the kind of farming that I grew up with. I wasn't quite there at that time. That was uh, painted in 1750. It hangs in the National Gallery. It's by Thomas Gainsborough. And it's actually, um, Gainsborough wasn't very interested in painting people, but he had to for the money, but its landscapes were his interest. And what he's painted here is a mixed farm landscape. And although um, you can see the corn, the, the drills of uh, corn harvested in the front, is actually grazing animals and the small fields and the hedges and lots of copses. And that is kind of like the default of ag default agriculture in Britain for over 200 years. That was actually painted in 1750. And that style of farming was still going on uh, when I grew up in the 1950s. And when I studied agriculture in Bangor, the default lowland farm was still the mixed farm with, uh, you know, so as we know, it would have grazing animals as well as crops grown for human consumption. <clears throat> and that's a kind of, when I worked as a student on my first farm um, in Berkshire, it was a mixed farm. It had a lot of arable, but it also had a dairy herd which rotated around the grassland on the farm. And the foods I grew up eating, um, we lived on a, a council estate in Reading, so nobody had any money in those days, but we all had organic food, and our meat was largely grass-fed. Our beef was largely grass-fed. It probably came from Argentina, I have to say, um, but it would have been from the Pampas grassland. Our milk, which was delivered daily, came from a dairy farm, uh, which was set up between the wars from um, a couple of... The, Conditions, prices were so low between the walls that a lot of dairy farmers started their own retail rounds. And one of them supplied our house, had grown to a big dairy, supplying half the town. And I don't know much about that milk, but it would have been cows grazing for much of the summer. In the winter, they'd have had silage. They probably would have grazed kale as well. And the cows would probably have been shorthorn cows, which were great grassland converters. So uh, the foods I ate were sort of grass-fed meat. Um, that mixed farming pattern produced very fertile soils. In fact, the leading scientist of the time uh, in my student days was um, Professor Sir George Stapledon, and he said the mixed farm was ideal for Britain um, for three reasons. One, it was largely self-sufficient, so you didn't have to be buying in chemicals or feeds from the other side of the world. It sustained fertility year after year, decade after decade and it was flexible. And he campaigned very much for mixed farming to be the center of production in Britain. Well, <clears throat> we threw that all away. Uh, we started in the early 70s, really, um, dismantling that uh, sustainable structure. We went over to continuous crop growing as the default on much of lowland Britain. Uh, with all the inputs, it was like uh, we waged chemical warfare on our soils, really. Those soils that built up over 100 years, hundreds of years under the traditional mixed farming system. And we all believed that uh, we knew about nutrition in the 1970s. And I'd grown up on those kind of, um, you know, meat and vegetables from uh, and fruit. Um, orchard fruit would have come from trees with mycorrhiza, fungi helping the nutrition and all that. So they would have been nutrient-dense foods. And, and we all started eating, myself included, we started stopped eating dairy foods. And uh, I went over to soya milk and vegetable oil spreads, all those things, and lots of carbohydrates. I had very little meat. And uh, that's how I ate for 20 years and ended up with sort of classical metabolic syndrome and all those conditions attached to that. And uh, that's the catastrophe of agriculture. That's um, near my home in 
West Somerset, and that's what happens whenever it rains because the soils are shot. And it's clear that depleted ecosystems cannot produce the nutrient-dense foods that we're entitled to, and we've destroyed it in a generation. <coughs> I, um, I published my first book, which was really a rant about why, with taxpayers' money, we were destroying these wonderful grasslands to grow wheat to put on the European Grain Mountain, which later got sold off cheap to the Soviets. And I had a wonderful letter from uh, a GP in Perthshire called Walter Yellow Lees. I'm sure some of you will know him, who was the founder of the McCarrison Society. And he was um, uh, a general, in general practice. He, he had a very distinguished wartime career, won the military cross. He served as a, a, served as a medic with the Highland Regiment. Uh, and he got his military cross. He was always the last man to leave the battlefield. Anyway, went back to his uh, GP practice in Persia and saw another tragedy unfolding. It was people dying in the prime of life from heart disease and cancers and many things like that. And he associated very much with the abandonment of the traditional ancestral Scottish diet and the going over to these uh, processed foods and particularly refined carbohydrates. And those are the kind of foods we eat. <coughs> And we're just beginning to learn what grazing animals, the part they play in not only um, putting nutrients into to meat, but the part they play in the whole system of uh, intercepting solar, the plants that intercept solar radiation. The plants actually, half the, the sugars and compounds produced by plants actually get fed through the roots as exudates. So they actually feed the microbes in their roots and we're just beginning to learn how important we know that a lot of our immunity comes from our uh, gut biomes. Well, plants work in very similar ways. They attract the right kind of microbes around their root systems, and it's these microbial populations in their roots that allow them to take up nutrients and also to protect themselves against pathogens. And uh, grazing animals in the traditional farming system were part of that whole process. I was listening, and those are the kind of um, plants that we used to be in the pastures uh, and all these things add to the good things that are in our foods if they're from, uh, you know, sustainable farming systems. So um, some of you, I'd like to end by just maybe saying a word about the food program. Some of you may listen to the food program. It's been wonderful the last couple of weeks. And the report has been out with uh, a tribe of hunter-gatherers um, in uh, Tanzania. And we went with them on a porcupine hunt and uh, they killed the porcupine and cooked it in the field and ate all of it, including the parts that we might not want to eat. But the interesting part, they had uh, um, uh, a professor with them from St. Thomas's Hospital who's very interested in gut microbiomes, um, and he was studying the relationship of food and the diet of hunter-gatherer peoples to um, their microbiomes. And he found that this uh, tribe, who've been living this way for 40,000 years, in East Africa, um, they have 40% more species in their gut microbiomes than the average Westerner. And many of these species that live in their guts actually protect them against all kinds of conditions that, that we suffer in Western, um, in our Western diets and so on. Um, so I wanted to uh, just end by talking about how we make, make up for what we've lost, what we've destroyed, and somehow we're, we're smart enough to make our farms to recreate those kind of environments like the, our hunter-gatherer ancestors would have inhabited. We, um, to develop sustainable systems, to make our farms. Uh, there are people um, talking a lot about rewilding these days and uh, George Monbiot who writes in The Guardian said quite a lot about you know uh, intensive agriculture allows us to take some land and rewild it and, and rescue nature if you like by protecting particular bits and rewilding it and my argument was we need to rewild our agricultural land and actually create the kind of sustainable um, semi-forest systems that we, our ancestors, would have grown up as hunter-gatherers. And we're smart enough to do that. And we know we can feed everyone on this planet if we do it the right way. So um, I think I'll leave it there um, and just say it's, 
we've got a great challenge. What we've destroyed in this country and our wonderful agriculture, we have got to recreate somehow. Thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you, Graham. Um, I think perhaps we'll take questions, questions at the end and create a seminar when we've heard everything that is to come now from um, the science side, the relationship between food and medicine. So, Professor of Food Science and Nutrition, Professor Angelika Plöger. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As you can hear, I'm not coming from Great Britain or England, I'm coming from Germany. That is uh, my special accent. I would like to thank first of all <laughs> Patrick for giving me the chance of having this exchange of ideas here at the conference. And secondly, for this wonderful dinner we had yesterday evening. It was incredible how nicely it was presented, how the quality of the food could be tasted and uh, thirdly, also the decoration um, of everything. So I, I went on grazing <laughs> yesterday, and it was very easy to be a vegetarian yesterday evening. So thank you once more for giving us this feeling and sharing also the uh, atmosphere of discussion together with food. And I think that is also a very important point when we are talking about harmony, eating, and um, or nutrition and health. So probably you see my first slide, harmony, food quality, and health. In this session, um, I was told should raise question. So we should together have a common learning process. This is the new approach in education. And therefore, my first question would be if I not if I would see this slide, why did you put the heart as a symbol for health and the term of mental health beneath? Why did you not combine both in one expression? The second question would be, why do we had yesterday a session about eating and agriculture and today a session about diet and health and agriculture? Yesterday I learned, and that was quite obvious, that of course the system of farming has an influence on the taste of, uh, for instance, cheese. So the meadow, the breed of the cow, and also the animal husbandry has an influence on the aromatic substances in milk, which will be even more profound in cheese. So there is a direct link, and the expression I learned yesterday, you have, you can taste the full system on your tongue. I, I think that's true. So if we are talking today about diet and health, it's something different as eating and health, it seems. But this should be our common question afterwards. So, I would like to give you the opportunity to have just a small... Oh, I put the wrong one. This one. Um, to give you a small introduction to where I'm coming from. I'm coming from um, Kassel University, so uh, Witzenhausen is the area where this Faculty for Organic Agricultural uh, Sciences is located. and. Um, it is very famous for its 140,000 cherry trees. And now it's cherry season, and I brought you some cherries with me. So just as a picture. And uh, what does it mean for us also as being a scientist in this uh, uh, field? That of course we should introduce the cultural quality of the cherry for this region by a guided tour as we established for our kids, but also for our tourists in the area. So it was part of my department. My department is called Organic Food Quality and Food Culture. And this is a quite important link to have the cultural aspect as part of the quality aspect. 
So we introduced this uh, guided tour for our tourists and also for our kids. So education, because we know that emotion is also deeply linked to eating and drinking. And therefore, we established in 1999 already a topic called feeling how it tastes. So to educate our young children in kindergarten and schools. This was supported by our former Ministry for uh, Consumer Protection, Food and Agriculture. Um, it was a Green Party minister who supported this idea. After the Green, then we had this Black uh, people. Um, they are very nice in traditions, but they didn't see an urgent need for educating our young people. So after five years, that was changed to the normal uh, procedure of educating nutrition. I was educated in the 1970s at the University of Gießen in Germany. And uh, although this university was quite famous for its uh, input in so-called whole food nutrition, um, we have been trained on a normal basis, so looking for recommended dietary allowances. Today it's called uh, daily um, recommended intake and of course for nutrition tables. So all that what we knew was about the intermediate um, process in our bodies and how to feed the body with nutrients. But I think that is not all. So as you can see here from Jonathan first, he pointed out as soon as we take fork and food, we demonstrate a position, a value. And yes, you can see here, for instance, the question is, should I eat more vegetables or should I go more for um, meat and meat products is today a question for many, many people. So if they say I'm a vegetarian, then behind this sentence and his food choice or this food choice is a special value. So, <clears throat> and uh, there is a German philosopher who said, each time we eat, the whole world is in use. With each meal, we decide how good we eat and consume the world. And you can see on one hand side, the um, fast food burger and on the other side, the, <clears throat> the amount of uh, grains and uh, grain is this gray uh, part and um, the uh, purple one is fat and sugars, the yellow one is eggs and milk products and the red one is uh, meat. And this is the consumption of, on average of the whole world. And if you could read even the, um, the um, uh, calorie intake, it would be sufficient for everybody nowadays. And now there is, there are the circles for US, it's on, the, on, on your left hand side and India on the, your right hand side. So you can see India is still taking a lot of grains and um, not so much uh, eggs and meat. And uh, on the other side, US, of course, a lot of meat and eggs and fat and sugars. And you know already the answer in combination to health. There we have <clears throat> a high incidence of high blood pressure, diabetes, and also coronary heart disease. So what we are eating and drinking is not only influencing our personal health, but also the health of the whole ecosystem. And this can easily be shown by the so-called ecological footprints and also called the biocapacity of our earth. So how many people we are on earth, how much do we need and <coughs> how much is uh, our, our resources. And this has to be in balance, then it's harmonic. I will not show you especially the details to that. We probably we can go afterwards on this point. But what I would like to show you is now, unfortunately, a German slide, but I, was, I couldn't agree yesterday to the statement of Brunhild, who <coughs> told us we need to have more facts. 
because we do not know how our nutrition system will be in the year 2030 or 2050. That is not true. Scientifically, we have so many facts, but we know that people are not acting how they are telling us they would act. So we really have a big gap between the intention and really the acting. So the question is here, we can see nowadays that is the right balloon, the CO2 equivalent which is used today for our nutrition. And if we would go more for reduce first of all the waste and secondly to go more for a vegetarian um, in the direction to a vegetarian consumption, then we have the reduction potential of 23%. And for 2030, we have to reduce, or 2050, we have to reduce it to um, all um, minus 7%, and this is possible by going more for, for local food. So we have now in Germany the intention to look for researchers looking for the new um, meat, it's called. What will be the meat in the future? Will it be insects? Will it be algaes? Or, do we do, or don't we need so much meat? So yesterday we have been also talking about the sustainability goals or sustainable development goals. And uh, <clears throat> as you can see here, the number two is um, to reduce hunger. Number second is good health and well-being. Also here you can see the differentiation between body health and mental well-being. And number 12 is um, um, consumption and production has to be in balance. And for me, harmony in nutrition means today sustainability, the quality of not being harmful to the environment or depletion uh, natural resources and thereby supporting long-term nutritional, ecological, social and economically balance. What I would like to, to show to you what is very important is, is education of the people or making them or empower them to be quite sure. People have the tendency to say, I depend on food. I have to eat at least three times or one time per day food. And then they have the feeling that they cannot influence the food system, not agriculture, nor the processing side. So feeling not having any influence. Then they are getting a lot of information, not always in the same direction, and they are looking what are the right values. What, what can I take over? What is okay, correct? So they are feeling insecure. And then they are lo uh, looking for leadership. And the question is, how can we, the scientists, <coughs> and truly, and the scientists or other people, how can we really influence them to do something? For instance, um, the, uh, the community-supported agriculture or urban farming might be a way. Uh, this feeling on, of being insecure is something which was pointed out also by Antonovsky when he is talking about health. So Antonovsky was a Russian scientist <coughs> telling us or his, the, the topic what he was debating was the topic of sense of coherence. And the sense of coherence means that life is comprehensible, manageable and meaningful. And um, to have this feeling is quite important if everything may change. You may change but also the environment may change. This was a definition coming up in 1979, and a colleague of mine, Machtel Huber from um, former Louis Beuk Institute, did a new uh, definition. Uh, she says, health as the ability to adapt and self-manage in light of the physical, emotional, and social challenges of life. So, here you find the harmony between body and soul and mind. That is, I think, a very good definition and a modern definition for the time we are in. 
And um, just to, to show you what is also possible in science, I will um, quote something of the book of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, Harmony, on page 112. He write, whether he wrote, whether it be the shape of a plant, the arrangements of petals in a flower, or the harmonies of music made when it's constructed according to this numerical relationship we call beautiful. And now I'm showing you something. I'm showing you beautiful carrots, and beside that, a picture that is quite beautiful. And the question is, what is the relationship between both? Here, is, here are two other pictures. So you can have on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, you see um, a fresh carrot and the picture of a fresh carrot, and on the left-hand side, the carrot which has been stored, the, where the juice has been stored and then crystallized. We call that biocrystallization. And in my department and together with two other working groups in Europe, we built a network and we were working now sin since 16 years on this crystallization methods. And we made already 85,000 pictures and behind each picture there was a laptop done, so that means we know everything what was going on in the lab. And we developed a computer or two computer programs because as you can see, no scientists would even say this is nice. They, they can say this is nice, but they cannot uh, treat that statistically. So what we did is to transfer the knowledge. This method comes from the anthroposophic area. It was done by um, Ehrenfried Pfeiffer and Silabri. So we, what we did during the last 16 years was to make it, to describe it in detail, to make it rep reproducible, to make it even validated for different questions. And with this method, we can easily distinguish between organic and conventional products. And we published that in acknowledged um, um, journals, scientific journals. But up to now, it's not taken up by science in general. So, we are convinced that what we see here is a so-called self-organizational principle. And one of the physicists I hired well, <coughs> has done also the studies about that. And here you can see, um, if you are giving this uh, juice together with copper chloride um, on a dish and let it crystallize, it will build these forms and we can demonstrate that over the time and can evaluate that afterwards. So this is a self-organization process. And I think for my personally, for myself, um, the expression Lady If Balfour did, the health of soil, plant and animal and man is one and undivisible, has to do something with the capacity of self-organization. And when this is true, then, of course, we cannot add some nutrients to our food to make it better, but it has to grow on Earth. It has to become the power of the universe. So, enrichment of food will then not be possible just by adding nutrients. That was the view we had years ago. Now we know there might be also, as you know, um, light you can have as a wave or as a corpuscle. So it is a dual character of light. And we have the same, I think, for food as well. And we have to go more into this direction to see how we define food quality. And when we have a special approach to food quality, then we can have a look how it will influence our health. And please, don't split health in mental and body health, as we scientists mostly do. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Angelica. I mean, outstanding and opening so many doorways of thought and ideas and matters that we can cover um, later when, uh, when Aruni has spoken. But one of the things that it triggered in my thought was this idea that people change and the environment changes. And so the future must not be so much teaching people what to choose and what to eat, but giving them the equipment to decide that bit of knowledge. And when I met Angelica on Sunday evening, I said, where are we going to be headed in our seminar on Tuesday morning? And she said, outcome. And whatever the outcome is going to be at the end, in my view, a lot of it has to be about education and about children. Because we may not change all the old geezers like me, but we can change children and give them the information they need to make their future decisions about what to eat. And children will grow up as a, a generation that persuade or have persuaded their parents about what should be bought at home, what should be eaten at home, how food should be prepared. Because children now have quite a voice and are able to do that. So hopefully we can cover that more later. But first, a bit more science from Professor Aruni Batnagar. Good morning, and thank you, Patrick, for the invitation, and thank you for accommodating me in this session. Uh, this has uh, been a very unusual experience to me, and I've never been in a, in a group of people who think so much different from what things that we think about, but certainly been very inspiring and, and sort of enabled, at least for me, to be able to then look at things much more differently than I'm used to looking at them. So what I thought I'd do today was to sort of talk to you and discuss the uh, relationship between health and food but it could not be discussed in isolation. We need to understand what it is that uh, we mean by health and, and how do we relate our, our health. And, and then from there, try to uh, sort of follow the principles of harmony and see how harmony is an essential concept in maintaining health and particularly our relationship with the environment. So I'm gonna start with an example about from heart disease. So that's what I know and, and I, I can talk about and then go into to sort of uh, a, a discussion about what the effect of the environment is on heart disease and then how it relates to food and food networks. So we know that heart disease is the leading cause of death uh, in the United States. There are many different types of heart disease, but the most prominent form is what is known as uh, uh, coronary artery disease, which is the development of plaque in atherosclerosis. And it's not just in the US, but it's in the world, right? in all regions of the world. In the last 10 years, whether it's in low-income countries, middle-income countries, developing countries, heart disease is, has become the number one killer. So the, that raises the question that now that we have got rid of this courage of infectious diseases, is it something about the basic structure of the human anatomy and physiology that predisposes almost all of us to heart disease? Or, or is it a sort of a manufacturing defect in humans that leads to heart disease? So looking at that, we, if you just not be more parochial, look outside our, our immediate family, we see that we have a distinguished set of cousins and they have co-evolved with us for many years. And most of them may have some sort of, of heart dysfunction like cardiomyopathy, which is like the enlargement of the heart. They could be fibrosis or heart failure, but, but none of them or very few of them have this garden variety heart disease, which is hardening of the arteries, it is atherosclerosis. And so from this analysis, we think that as humans, we don't have a family history of coronary artery disease. That is something very intrinsic to us as a species. So could it be the genes? So if we compare the genes say, of a human being and we compare that to the genes of a chimpanzee, we find that we are very, very similar. Overall, the, the genome of a human being and a chimpanzee differs only by 2.5%. In, in contrast, that humans only differ by 0.5%. So there aren't the big genetic differences between a human and a chimp to explain why we are so susceptible to heart disease. Moreover, you know, whatever the differences there are between humans and chimps are cognitive function uh, genes, they're not metabolic genes. And the genes which are very good at, prevent, uh, at maintaining health in apes and chimps are the same genes that cause us to have heart disease and uh, chronic illness. So what's the reason? And this is where we come to a very deep relationship that's sort of indicated by the harmony principle. A gene is supposedly good when it's well adapted to its environment. So suppose you have an ancestral gene, and this ancestral gene is adapted to its environment, and we have health. But when the environment changes, 
the gene then becomes maladapted. It's gene no longer in, equal, in, in harmony with the environment around, and that leads to maladaptation, and then over the course of evolution, by positive or negative selection, that we get a new variant of the gene that's again adapted to the environment. And so part of the sort of uh, chronic disease burden that we have could be attributed to this mismatch or the lack of harmony between our ancestral genes and our current environment. Our environment has changed so rapidly that our primordial genes have had, had, haven't had the time to adapt to these changes. And this mismatch or lack of harmony underlies the basic development of disease. So how do we define human environment and say, maybe we know the genes, we have, we have sort of uh, scanned the human genome, we know what, it, what people have, what genes we have, but how do we define the environment? And that's a much more complicated task because the human environment is very complex. It consists of large social networks and it's defined by the history and the culture of that particular uh, group. And we have sort of differently adapted to our ecosystems that we live in. But overall, if you could look at the environment in different entities, we think that there could be three identifiable domains of component. There is a large natural environment, which means the, the, the ecology, the geography that we live in. And then there is the social environment that we create around ourselves. And then nested within this large social environment is a personal environment an environment that's populated by the choices that we make. But these choices are not independent. For example, let's look at food. The social environment is the environment that determines the food networks, so type of foods that are available to us. Now, within those choices, we can make some personal choices, but it's our choices for nutrition are not independent of the social structures and the uh, sort of uh, food networks that we live in. Most of, most of us don't have the luxury to grow our own food. So in the combination of the natural environment, the social environment, and our personal choices and our personal environment bears upon the, uh, the actual health and particularly cardiovascular health. So I'll walk you through so what these components of different, of different components are and how they relate to health. So let's start with the natural environment. So the natural environment is then uh, that governs all of us. And then if you live in unconducive environments, then there is an environmental dyssynchrony. And this mismatch between the genes and the current environment circumstances can give rise to disease. But we cannot discount the impact of our genetic backgrounds either. We need to consider both. So the genes that we have today evolved th several hundred thousand years ago. And so our current genetic makeup uh, has memories of our past environment, the environments that we are uh, evolved in. And so, as we progress, the, those, these memories of these genes change and develop into new types of adaptation with, the, with our current environment. And so the most sort of, uh, direct influence that genes have, is in the, or the most direct influence that the environment has, is in the um, natural environment. The natural environment is the cycles of night and day, the rhythms of the season, the uh, green spaces around us, and they have much more profound impact on our health than we can be recognized. And this, for example, let's consider green spaces. So we know that people who live in proximity to green spaces have a decrease in cardiovascular disease or, or have better health. Uh, we, may not, we do not understand the reasons why, that maybe to do less stress, maybe because something the plants emit that we breathe, or whether it is that when you're, you have a green environment, you tend to be more outside. But regardless of all these reasons, there's several studies consistently show that there's a relationship to it. And there was a, a recent study, which incidentally, uh, when, yeah, when day before yesterday we met Prince Charles, he actually knew this, this study that I was talking to him about, and which is that in the United States, we had the ash borer infestation, which uh, sort of killed about 150 million ash trees. And it started from up north, and as the epidemics increased, there was a corresponding increase in cardiovascular deaths. So in, in communities where trees die, people die as well. And so this is an important lesson that we are so inextricably linked with the natural environment that our wellness and our health depends upon what around, surrounds us. So to uh, sort of understand that, we're going to do a project that we're going to start at the end of this year, which we call the Green Heart Project. And this is to see whether if you increase greenness, 
in an in a, in a area would that decrease the levels of pollution in the area, rates of disease, and or whether this would decrease stress, increase social cohesion. And for that, we're planning to then plant like 8,000 mature trees in a, in, a re, in a residential area. And then before planting, we would do an evaluation of the cardiovascular health of the people in the area. We look at the levels of air pollution, and then we see whether planting the trees would make any difference to, not only to the, men, to the physical health of the people, but also to the mental health and social co cohesion within that community. Just like the, the, uh, the green spaces, the cycles of night and day have a profound effect, and we talked about sleep. It is that whenever there is the, all our genes are entrained to the cycles of night and day. We, uh, every cell in our body has, a, has clock genes, and then we have a sort of a master clock in the brain. And this master clock is tuned to the sunlight and to the variations in, in feeding patterns. And these sort of cues are called the zeit givers, and they regulate the master clock in the, in the brain. And it's this synchrony or lack of harmony with the natural rhythms is a very important risk factor for not only heart disease, but for obesity and diabetes. If people who live in, with dyssynchrony in the environment are, are much at a much higher risk. And it's not just shift workers, although we see much more uh, pronounced effects there, but for most of us, we were not evolved to live in uh, whatever, 12 hours of light, or more than 12 hours of light uh, during a day. And so we are always in this state of dyssynchrony that our body clocks don't know how to deal with. Similarly, uh, altitude. We are, uh, we, some people who live at higher altitudes are healthier, and the people living at sea levels, are, they, feel they are uh, adapted, are, are in good health. But if then people move from one uh, location to the other, there is a health cost associated with that. Um, with the seasons, there are air times of the year when if you are in a, uh, you can maintain your cholesterol better in winter than in summer. Even, even with, on treatment with statins, there's much better compliance, sort of, uh, it's easier to reach your target goals in, in summer than it is in winter. Uh, most of the cardiovascular mortality, maybe like 30, 40% is associated uh, with winter years, winter months. And people thought, well, that's because, you know, people are in indoors and they have all these problems and so there was more deaths in winters. But then the study from Los Angeles showed that even though there's no winter in Los Angeles, there are much higher mortality in winters, which again brings uh, forth the idea that there is a synchrony between the rhythms of nature and human well-being. So it, why this could be? One of the reasons could be that maybe that in winter there is sort of less uh, sunlight than it is in summer. We are actually like plants, we, uh, like plants un uh, undertake photosynthesis to synthesize uh, carbohydrates, we undertake photosynthesis to synthesize vitamin D. So the sunlight is a critical regulator of health, not only in vitamin D synthesis, but also in regulating blood pressure and, uh, and cardiovascular disease, particularly diabetes. So the, we are attuned to certain levels of sunlight, depends upon how we are adapted to it. So people who are, have a sort of lighter skin would do better in northern climates, and people with darker skin would do better in southern climates. And we see that not only with the, with the sort of cardiovascular disease, but also with risk factors. For example, blood pressure, uh, as you go up the, from the equator, you can see a gradient of blood pressure in, increasing. So the further you are from the equator, the greater is the blood pressure. And it is true both for the northern and the southern hemispheres. So, but this, the, component of the, the components of the natural environment are moderated by the social environment. And the social environment is something that we shield ourselves, we create this world around ourselves to shield us from the natural world because the natural world, it's, it's beautiful, it's nice and pretty and bucolic, but it's in its very element, the natural world is also dangerous, it's got predators, it's got pests, it's got parasites. So it's, it, it, nature in its true essence is red in tooth and claw. So we have created this civilization around us to save us from nature to begin with. But in building this environment, create a whole new set of problems. We build cities where nobody can walk, and, we, and there is high levels of disease associated with people living in lots of levels of light and traffic and noise. We also have high levels of pollution. We, in the, this is a sort of not a new phenomena, but it is an extensive one. In, in just in the United States, we have 150,000 deaths due to cardiovascular disease because of air pollution. People used to think that because of asthma and because of lung disease, pollution is bad, but now we know about 80% of people who die prematurely because of exposure to air pollution die of heart disease. 
We do not know the reason why, but it's, you know, it's, it's universal. We have seven million excessive deaths in the, in worldwide every year because of the levels of air pollution. And it's one of the externalities of agriculture, at least in the Western United States, 60% um, of pollution comes from agriculture and farming. And so these are costs that we need to consider uh, that we have in the health when we're trying to write the final equations about what it, how what sort of food we eat and what sort of food we grow. But for all sorts of different ex environmental exposure, cardiovascular disease is the one of the ma major outcomes. Uh, and that causes uh, us to reconsider what it is that makes the heart and the blood vessels so sensitive to the levels of air pollution. Then, of course, there is the, the social, socioeconomic status. People who live, uh, who have higher levels of income are much better, uh, have maintained better health, maybe because of better nutrition, better access to medical care, whatever the reasons may be, but they consistently show much better health outcomes than people with low, lower socioeconomic status. But also what matters most are social networks and the type of networks that people live in have a, a profound influence on the well-being. So, so if we were trying to argue about the, the uh, causes of obesity, so they, they found a gene and it's called the fat gene. Now this, if you have this gene, you have 5% greater risk of having, uh, uh, being obese. But if you have an obese, close obese friend, you have 50% chance of being obese. So the influence of social networks is so much more profound than that are genes that we need to put, uh, in, sort of be cognizant of this uh, sort of influence when we finally compute the risk from all the environmental changes. Then finally, there is the personal environment. Like I said, this is an environment populated by our own personal choices, choices that are restricted and restrained by the social environment. And of course, one of the choices is physical activity. We can choose to be physically active. And if the environment is conducive, if you live in inner cities, there isn't much opportunity to walk. And then we blame the individual for making the wrong choices. You're lazy, you're fat, you're not motivated, and you, know, you, don't, you don't have good shoes. But the, the, un, the fundamental problem is that uh, the environment that they live in is not conducive to any physical activity, and which bears a, an important uh, cost because about 35% uh, of, the act of uh, excessive cardiovascular mortality is due to physical inactivity. We have come to realize that, that uh, physical inactivity or sitting is a new smoking, and it, the overall burden of cardiovascular disease in the world by physical inactivity last year exceeded the burden of smoking. So we need to, be, to have an environmental um, sort of uh, reevaluation of being physically active in a normal daily way. But most important is, is smoking, and that's again been around for a long time, and that causes, uh, that is the, uh, the leading cause of preventable death. And finally, the topic of the day, it's nutrition. So we have recognized this for a long time, that food is medicine. And that when you have uh, good food, you don't need medicine, and, or at least you can have minimal amount of medicine. But the problem, at least for, from a scientific point of view, we've not been able to define well what is good food. Although we know some of the, the basic principles, we know some of the costs associated with different types of diets, we haven't yet come out with the universal recommendation. And maybe there isn't a universal recommendation. And the reason I traced all these things for you was to make the point that the type of food we need may be different, with the, it differs with the environment. Maybe people who live in high altitudes, maybe people who live in arid climates, and the people who live in very cold uh, areas have different nutritional demands. And that we need to be aware that this sort of eco-nutrition is an important concept that may be because we, are, we cannot have a one sort of thing fit one, one glove shoe fit everyone. We have to be cognizant of not only environmental evolutionary backgrounds, but also social economic uh, networks that we live in. So that's the context that we need to understand in, in terms of food. We know some basic facts. We know that the food is a profound influence. If you just changed your 5%, just 5% of your energy from, from saturated to unsaturated fat, there is a 42% decline in cardiovascular disease risk. So it doesn't take a very large amount of life change to be able to, to see the benefits. Similarly, if you decrease your uh, energy consumption of trans fats, you could just by 2%, you could see a 20%, uh, uh, if, if you increase your, your consumption of trans fats by 2%, you see a 23% increase in cardiovascular events. You see a threefold increase in sudden cardiac death. 
So these are not unachievable goals that if you decrease two to five percent of the type of the bad fat that we eat, that it could significantly uh, change your risk for cardiovascular disease. But the food can also, so this change in feeding patterns has profound influences in population health. So one example is China, in, oh, sorry, in Japan. And in Japan, when people moved after Hiroshima to the United States and adapted Western practices, we saw a twofold increase in stroke and twofold increase in cardiovascular disease. And, and which a large part could be attributable to this diet, a diet that was different, new, high in saturated fat, and not conducive or in harmony to the evolutionary and cultural backgrounds of the Japanese. But uh, one striking example is what is known as the Finnish miracle. In the 70s, Finland had the highest rates of heart disease in the world with over sort of 60 to 65 percent mortality in anybody over 65 in Finland. Um, from that time, they adopted, a, they changed their food policy, they discontinued subsidies on pork and dairy products, EU was created and so they could import fresh fruits and vegetables all through the year and that they had created a culture of, of different, of a healthy eating. So what happened? There was a 65% decline in cardiovascular mortality from 1971 to 1995. There is no other recorded instance of such a drastic improvement in cardiovascular health in any other country. And this was primarily and specifically associated with changing dietary patterns from one type of restricted diet to a more varied and fresh diet. So there is enough evidence, it should be startling evidence, to underscore the idea that nutrition is key to maintaining cardiac health. So again, what should we eat? Is it that one type of food is better than the other type of food? And whether regulation and policy makes a difference. And this is an example from Poland, when they implemented a nutritional program uh, for a, a sort of 24% decrease in, unsaturated, uh, in, uh, in the consumption of, it should say, saturated fatty acids. And there was, uh, if you increase polyunsaturated fatty acids, you get a, a decrease in cardiovascular mortality. So, so public policy, awareness, you know, campaigns like this, it, when, uh, people like, like who are here, when we, we get together and think about and, and, and make changes in our social environments, in our food networks, that's going to make the biggest difference, not statins given by GPs to every individual person at risk, but to change the, the outcomes and health of entire populations. That's what such initiatives can accomplish. The, uh, the startling example is in China, which the opposite happened there, where in the, uh, in the 80s there was an influx of fast food, and from, uh, from the 80s to the 90s saw a 50% increase in cardiovascular deaths. So again, the, in China in, in, in before the 80s, heart disease was virtually unknown. We introduced Western diet and we introduced uh, heart disease. And now, with, the, with the high levels of air pollution, that problem is further exaggerated. So what are we gonna do? So, the, the mantra so, um, so far has been that we need to, uh, to be motivated, people need to make the right choices, that those are things that matter, that we need to change ourselves, we cannot change the world. But it, it is as individuals living in complex, advanced societies, we cannot make all the choices we need to be making, and therefore social structures have to be changed uh, for an individual to completely um, sort of uh, redeem the promises of development, of science and health and medicine. And we are going to be uh, sort of in a, in a no-win situation if we keep uh, investing all this effort in getting the best medicine and the best science and the best treatment where we keep having more and more disease. In the United States, we had figures come out this year that after uh, sort of next, from next year, there's the increase in sort of life expectancy has stalled. Our children would be the first children since the Industrial Revolution who would not see an increase in life expectancy. And that's because of the epidemics of diabetes, because of diabetes of, uh, of uh, obesity. And those things, conditions are not so bad in themselves, but they profoundly increase the rates of heart disease. In every corner of the globe, the rates of heart disease are going to increase. And unless we uh, adopt the thinking that we have been talking about here of healthy food and healthy nutrition, we are unlikely to, to benefit and we are unlikely to make any dent in, in the prevention and in management of cardiovascular disease and human health in general. Thank you.
Uh, really, that was outstanding because you've gathered together all those little bits of information that medical men like me have, but you've distilled it down so beautifully into that presentation. That, that Finland experience is amazing, isn't it? And somehow we've got to be headed in that direction, I feel. And there are, you know, I began this morning by saying it's a very, very big subject. There are things we haven't been able to touch upon. Um, uh, David Wilson sitting here in the audience, uh, top, top quality farmer, taught me that glyphosate that is everywhere, the weed killer that people use as Roundup in their own gardens, glyphosate's heat stable. It appears in the flour that the bread is made from. So people eat glyphosate every day. We've probably had, well, we probably haven't this morning here, but people in the hotels, if they had a toast, might have done. But hey, what does that do to you? There are so many unexplained things going on in our environment. You know, and then I started thinking, is glyphosate why men's sperm counts are dropping? We don't know. The work hasn't probably been done. So there is a great deal that we haven't been able to cover today about pollutants in the environment and so on and what they're doing to health and what there is in food that can protect by way of giving you antioxidants that can mop up the free radicals that do the damage to our DNA and cause cell apoptosis and death and cancer and so on. But for me, before we get to questions in 30 seconds time, I think it's going to all be about education. It's about getting the public on board and as I said earlier, it's got to come. We've got to start with children and the great thing was having the school teacher here on the stage yesterday showing us what he was achieving in that regard. And that, you know, that was a marvelous moment for me to see. And another marvelous moment is seeing Sir Anthony Selden here in the audience, a world name in education. And, and, and he's the sort of man that we need to tap into. People who can influence what happens to our five, six, seven, eight year olds. So they will come home and insist on having this or this or that rather than what they're maybe currently craving. So um, now I think we should open the floor and, and uh, there are different qualities of scientific evidence. The, the, the thing with food is, and that's the reason that there is all this disbelief in the general public about expert opinions. One day they say, you come out and say, well, let's all eat eggs. And the next week you get an article in the paper say, oh, eggs are no good and so on. The reason for all of this is that it's very, very difficult to get a high quality, rigorous evidence. The best way to get a scientific evidence is to do what they call a randomized control trial. Do a randomized control trial means you take a lot of people, randomize them, give them one diet in one group and the other diet, in, uh, other group, another set of diet. That's very difficult to do and to follow for a long time. Regardless, there has been a couple of studies, and there's one study from Spain published four years ago, in which they randomized people to Western diet and to Mediterranean diet. So they found that Mediterranean diet was better than the saturated diet. Now, whether we talked about the soil and whether there are different types of farming systems that contribute to the quality of the diet, of food, and whether that contributes to overall outcomes is completely unknown. There isn't, to my knowledge, any particular significant study showing that food grown in this one particular way is healthier than maybe the food grown in this other X different way. Yeah, so there is a sort of a lack of continuation of this understanding, not only just the food itself, but the process that give rise to that food. So we need to do such studies. I disagree. <laughs> because um, organic farming has now been uh, regulated since years, since 1992. And um, it has regulated the way of farming and also the way of processing food. And um, up to now there are so many studies published to see how uh, different those uh, nutrients in some plants are or in milk are and so on. Um, but of course, then you have to bridge the link to human health. And that is quite dif difficult, I think. So there have been um, evidence-based uh, results that organic can lead to better taste, to better nutrients in, for instance, plants and also milk and eggs. But to say then that an organic diet is healthier than a conventional diet, that's not possible so far. But we are going now the next step. So 
Um, years ago, we created an um, uh, organization called Food Quality and Health. And this organization has now taken over or uh, taking the lead for a special research project being one of the, the eight flagship projects of the UN. And they are taking examples from all over the world to look how organic diet, not organic food, but an organic diet being introduced, for instance, in schools, in hospitals, or at a special area in, in a country, can influence public health or individual health. And we are now looking for, it's not me, it is one of my former staff members, uh, Dr. Karl. He is now looking for getting um, more information out of the different countries. And it has to be organic food being regulated according to this um, EU or um, analog um, regulation. So this is the only way to say it's according to the regulation organic food. And this will be the next step. So we are now looking for partners in this direction. I think we know that uh, the soil is just, this is the this, well, the Soil Association is called the Soil Association. It starts with the soil and all health develops from that. And the Hawley experiment showed this. I mentioned in, in my brief talk uh, Sir George Stapledon, who was the agricultural scientist in, in my student days, really, in the 60s. And he became very disillusioned with agricultural science at the end of his career because he was particularly disillusioned that the scientists were increasingly becoming specialised and getting narrower and narrower in their focus. And he believed that this would actually lead to catastrophe. And you, you talked about glyphosate. George, Hen um, George Stapledon figured that there are so many variables in you know, the system that farmers manage and that we, our food is a result of, that reductionist science would never actually evaluate it sufficiently. And he uh, predicted that we would take enormous risks and the revolution in the way we've produced our food that's happened in 30 or 40 years have enormous implicit risks. And glyphosate may be one of them. That may be the next catastrophe that uh, George Table said is almost bound to happen because of our levels of ignorance. And he called on his fellow scientists to actually almost stop this kind of reductionist sort of research, but to actually take lessons of the past to become wise in a sense and, and have an overview and think about things before we rushed into them. Um, I'm not sure that I put that very well, but he, we, in my lifetime, we've gone from what we knew was a very sustainable system of food production and we've gone to something which is full of risks. And, um, and, we, and if there isn't a bit of scientific research with, you know, with the randomized trials done within 20 years, the knowledge is discounted. So we've actually discounted 10,000 years of knowledge of how to manage soils. Very good. Sir. Just to add to the point that there is, of course, much wisdom and much knowledge in trying to understand that cattle fed in a certain way are healthier, and they may, when you go measure, they might high, have higher levels of, say, B vitamins, Omega-3, and so they're better. That's a different question from saying that really that equates to better health, right? It, maybe there is an increase in vitamin D, so on, and the health of the meat, but that, does that, is that sufficient? Is 5% increase going to make any difference? So ultimately, we have to rely on understanding what the outcomes are, and for all the flaws that we have in our approaches, being reductionist and with being... Uh, you know, short-sighted, th there is little alternative to uh, going forward in ways of thinking and understanding that's more evidence-based. Even there is tradition, we don't need to discount, discount the tradition, but we need to evaluate that and there needs to be evidence for some things because we've got lots of good tradition but lots of bad ones too, so we need to sort that out. Not all fats are bad. The good ones are the unsaturated, polyunsaturated fatty acids, we call them PUFAs. 
There is also great value in, in fats such as the omega-3 fatty acids which come from fishes. The big culprit is of course saturated fat which we need to avoid and so the overall understanding as I understand it is that we should have a diet rich in omega-3 fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids and low in saturated fat. I think um, I, I'm very optimistic actually. Um, I, I think we can make great progress, but education, communication is the key to it. And if anything depresses me, it's um, the forces we have ranged against opening uh, you know, our, our neighbors' eyes about food, how it's produced, and you know how, how great our whole environment could be if we just put the bits together right. I mean, I, st I started getting very incensed about, incensed about how we were destroying our wonderful nature and wildlife to produce, you know, surpluses to put on grey mountains. And I realised the whole thing is totally political, you know, and we, you know, we produce grain that way because the huge profits to be made out of producing grain that way, mostly not by farmers. Um, I, I think things are changing very quickly, and I think um, there are great opportunities to communicate. Yesterday, uh, we had a chap on this platform talking about Farm Drop and, and the app for actually connecting consumers with sustainably produced food. And it looked, uh, you started to think Tesco didn't have a chance of surviving against that sort of thing. So I'm very optimistic, uh, in, I'm very optimistic we can get the soil right, we can get our food and farming right. And I'm also very optimistic that if we can get the message over to consumers who basically want food that's going to make them healthy, that uh, we'll do that.